Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Deuteronomy 30, beginning with verse 1. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your for fortunes and have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you, even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens. From there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you back to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors." The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will, get, you will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your land. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous just as he delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in the book of the law and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. Today, we're talking about how to have a reset button in our lives. How many of you would like to reset some decisions that you've made in your life? How many of you have mistakes that you continue to dwell with and live with? Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm preaching to the right crowd here today because you know what, no matter who I talk to, we are always kind of haunted by the valley of the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, right? All the things that we should have done, all the things we could have done, and all the things that we would have done. And those shoulda, coulda, wouldas rob us of enjoying the life that God has promised for each and every one of us here and now. The Israelites are no different than us. As we read in Deuteronomy 
The Israelites had this kind of thing where they would come near to God during difficult times and they would forget about God during the good times. And as they forgot about God, God would give them warnings in their life. And as those warnings would come about, sometimes they would take heed, but most of the time they would ignore the warnings. And then God would end up having to allow the Israelites, as in this case, to be dispersed among the nations. They, they could no longer be this core group that God desired for them. God, remember, wanted them to lead them out of bondage into a new land, a land where they would be prosperous. And in this land, he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And that sounds all well and good until actuality and reality sets in. And so the people end up forgetting about God, but God never forgets about them. The people make a lot of mistakes, but God always offers them a reset button. You see, if I was God, I would have forgotten about these Israelites a long time ago. Way back in that garden, they would have ticked me off. Everybody would have ticked me off enough that I wouldn't have given a, another chance. But we serve a God of second chances. We serve a God many times of third chances, of fourth chances. We serve a God who has been described, as one author put it, as the great hound of heaven, who is constantly pursuing his people to draw them back. And that's what we see within this passage in Deuteronomy 30. Not only does God say, I'm going to offer you a reset button and we're going to start all over again, but God says it's going to be better this time. And no matter where you are, no matter where those mistakes have taken you, you are are not so far beyond my grip of grace that I cannot draw you back. God says, I'm going to go wherever you are and I'm going to bring you back to myself. Your job, my job, is to just seek him with all of our hearts, with all of our minds and let God be God. Let God be the God of our yesterdays. Let God be the God of our today and truly to allow God to be the God of our tomorrows. But we will never to allow, be able to allow God to be the God of today as long as we are looking back on the valley of the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. So here's my question for you today. Do you need a reset button in life? Do you need to hit that reset button? You see, um, I work a lot on computers. How many of you work a lot on computers there? And how many of you have had the awkward situation where that little circle comes up or the hourglass and it never goes away. You're waiting to do something and that little circle is there agitating you. That happens to me pretty much every Sunday morning that there's a little circle on my computer agitating me as I'm trying to get everything printed out for today's sermon. And I'm like, I got to go. And most of the time, the dog has to go, I got to go, and I got to get here all at the same time. And that little circle is just agitating me. And I'm always tempted to hit that reset button to start all over again. And you know what? Sometimes that's the best thing that you can do is to hit that reset button because somehow the computer has too many windows open at the same time and there's not, people that know computers now tell me all this stuff. There's not enough RAM and you don't have a high enough processor speed and blah, 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 blah. But one thing I know in my life is that many times I feel like I don't have enough RAM. I don't have enough processor speed. I don't have enough to settle all the different things that are coming at me. And why is that? Well, the Bible tells us that God gives us our daily bread. We ask that of him in our Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. He gives us grace for today, but he doesn't give us bread and grace for yesterday. That bread and grace has been used up. It's done. The manna comes down. The manna comes down for you to eat. The daily bread for today. But you know what we end up doing is we end up using our energy, our grace for today on things yesterday. We end up using our grace and our energy for today on things that may or may not happen tomorrow. Either way, what ends up happening is, like that computer, that little circle begins to form in our life. The little circle where there, it feels like life is caving in, where there, there just isn't enough processor speed in our lives to be able to handle everything coming at us. And whenever we feel, start feeling overwhelmed, we have to begin taking inventory of our lives. 
Because the Bible tells us that being overwhelmed is not something that should be part of the follower of Jesus Christ. Because after all, we're called to walk on the water, not be drowned by the water. So therefore, if we are feeling overwhelmed, as I oftentimes do, that's when I have to take an inventory of all the different windows that I have open in my life. And a lot of times, those windows that end up sucking so much of my energy are windows that are useless, that should have been closed a long time ago, because they may never happen or they dwell in the valley of the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. And the one thing that I enjoy about God, well, there's lots of things that I enjoy, but one of the things that I enjoy about how God defines himself, when Moses says, who shall I say sent me? God says, tell them I am sent you. Not I was, not I will be, but I am. God is a God of the present. He's doing something here and now, and he wants to awaken our minds and our hearts and our spirits to the brand new thing that he's doing. But the problem is we can't move on because we find ourselves condemned. We condemn ourselves by the mistakes that we have made in our lives. But here's the thing that we all need to recognize that mistakes happen. And we have to give ourselves a little bit of liberty and a little bit of freedom to understand that we are going to make mistakes. We have made mistakes that we are human. Now, that isn't to say that that is an excuse to go about living a sloppy lifestyle. But that is, an, that is a reason for us to look back and go, you know what? I try and I will fail at times. But the true failure is not getting back up after I have fallen down. Amen. Amen. This is what it says in, a, in Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Speaking of Jesus, here's the thing. God knows you're going to mess up. God knows you've made mistakes. And here's the thing. God has already cleared that path for you by laying all your mistakes, all your sins, all your iniquities, everything upon Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He's already taken account for all of that. There is nothing that you or I can do to surprise the Almighty. But isn't that somehow we think that? Like somehow God is surprised by this? Or how about this one? Somehow we have done the, the worst thing that God can forgive everybody but me. Right? And I talked about that before. I think I talked about that last week, where that's a reverse form of narcissism. You know, it's a form of narcissism that God can love everybody but you because you are so special. And as I've told you before, you ain't that special. Because we're all like sheep have gone astray. And you know what? Have you looked at sheep lately? They aren't that smart. You know what sheep do? They eat and they poop and they eat and they poop. And that's all they kind of do. And then they grow hair in the process and grow fur in the process. But all they do is just, they're just sitting there eating their thing for that day. And they might end up falling off a cliff because they're just following one another, just eating and doing their thing. They have to rely upon the shepherd because sheep aren't that smart. Our problem is, is that we see ourselves as that we are wise in our own eyes don't we? We think that we, somehow we can fix our lives. And if you don't think so, think about how many times we are so open to giving our advice to one another. Because our advice is God's gift to the world. Because before each and every one of us, there was not the oracle of God upon the world. But now, because of our opinion, we freely give that opinion to one another. And yet we can't get out of our own way, but we're going to try to help somebody else get out of their own way. James chapter 3 verse 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. Everybody say that. We all stumble in many ways. That should be a liberating, liberating verse right there. That it is right there, right in black and white. We all stumble. We all like sheep have gone astray. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Uh, I ain't there, you. So none of us are perfect. We all stumble. We're all going to make those mistakes. But here's the question. Why do we end up making these mistakes in our life? Well, the first one is, and I've shared this before, the dumbest, eh, dumbest thing that somebody has ever, one of the dumbest things that somebody has ever said to me is follow your heart. This is what it tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9 about our heart. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful because the heart doesn't know what it wants. The minute it gets something, it wants the next thing, doesn't it? Or the minute it gets it, then it starts complaining about what it got. You know what I'm talking about. You ladies that are asking for a special someone, and then you get that special someone, and they ain't so special anymore. <laughs> but yet your heart wanted it. You prayed to God for it. Or how about you prayed to God for that new job? And now all we're doing is complaining about the job we got. And that somebody would really kill to have that job that we got. The heart doesn't know what it wants. And so listening to the heart is really dumb. Listening to our feelings. And that isn't to say that feelings and emotions don't play a part in our decision making. But it certainly is a problem if we make that our number one indicator of which way we're to go in our life. The second one, second reason that we make mistakes is do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It's whenever we get our eyes off of Jesus, whenever we get our eyes focused on ourselves and we start thinking about what we should do. And you know what we do is we end up forming little committees in our life. And we, we talk to other people about what we, again, should be doing rather than focusing on God and trusting in God. What is it? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding and let me add in a little little comment there lean not on the understanding of other people either but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path God wants to be God and he wants to lead us into good lands, prosperous lands. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be whole individuals. But in order for us to do that, we need to recognize we don't know what we're doing ourselves. And we need to not be so wise in our own eyes with our way of thinking. Because here's the thing about our way of thinking. It should change over time. Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But now I put childish things away. Our thinking is meant to grow and our thinking is meant to mature and it's God who does the growing and the maturing as we keep our eyes focused on him. And lastly, which ties it all together, pride goes before the destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. Proverbs 16, 8. I grew up hearing that passage from my mom. From my mom. Pride goes before the destruction, Robin. Uh, nothing like a good bedtime story to make you feel warm at night. But, but it's really true, like pride is at the center of all rebellion. Pride is at the center of all of our problems that we end up having in our lives. If we end up entering in with humility into all the situations in our lives, then what are we going to do? We're not going to be so resistant to God, but we're going to submit ourselves to God. And what it tells us in James is when we submit ourselves to God, and we will then be, re -able, be able to resist the devil. We will be able to resist those bad things when we humble ourselves, when we submit ourselves to God. But we know that pride gets in our way and pride manifests itself in all different types of ways. But one of the ways, what do I want? What do I need? What, what I, whenever I becomes at the center of that, of that sentence, there's a pride issue there. So here's the question. Why does God allow us then to make these mistakes? I mean, after all, God is very patient with his people. God is very patient with us. Why does he continue to allow us to make these mistakes? Well, God knows that the only way that most of us ever truly grow is to make those mistakes. Now, just because you make a mistake, I need you to hear something. You are not married to the mistake that you make. You are not married to the mistake you make. You have been set free. And whom the Son has set free is free indeed. You are not... So, like, I get people who talk to me, before I go on in that scripture, I get people that talk to me about mistakes that they made 10 years ago, 15, 20, and they are still paying interest on something that Jesus has already paid off. You're, all, you're paying interest and the bill's already been paid. How ridiculous is that? 
Because you sat there and you think that somehow you're married to a decision that you made five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Remember that passage in Paul, or again, that Paul passage. We're growing. When I was a child, I thought like a child. Don't hold me accountable. You know what? When I was a little kid, I used to steal things from the store. I used to put things up my shirt and walk out the store. I was a little kleptomaniac. At nine years old, I was stealing things from Rite Aid. And my mom would be like, what's underneath your shirt, Robin? Nothing, as I had the outline of a toy underneath my shirt. I remember actually getting caught one time. My mom's like, I don't remember that. That's because she has selective amnesia, and I prefer it that way sometimes. But, but I remember her making me go into the store and having to go here, I'm sorry for stealing this and whatever. And that, that was my punishment there. But you know what? What would be a shame now is if someone would look at me as an adult and go, thief, you stole something when you were eight years old at Rite Aid. I stole a couple more times after that, but you got the point. I don't steal anymore. We grow. We learn from our mistakes. We, that's how we change. This is what it says in James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. So well, here's what we got to see. First, it seems absolutely ridiculous that James says, consider it pure joy when you're going through trials of many kinds. Like if you send me that greeting card, we ain't talking again. But consider, right? Consider it pure joy. What do you mean? Well, here's what it tells us in Hebrews about joy. Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. He endured the cross because he didn't just look at the cross. He looked at what God was going to do as a result of the cross. My friends, what, when James is saying, consider him pure joy, he's not saying, hey, be happy that you're going through this tough time. In fact, it's okay to have a pity party now and then. It's okay to get angry. But understand that God isn't giving up on you and he can take the junk of your life and he can make something wonderful out of it. He will do something wonderful out of it. it. Joy is having an expectation of hope that is fulfilled. Let me say that again. Joy is the expectation of hope fulfilled. That is, whatever is coming up against me, I know that it is going to work out for the good. Because that's the promise. God Let's these things happen in our lives so that we can be mature, that we can be complete and not lacking in any good thing. And for most of us, if you're a parent, how many of you are parents out there? Okay, you have witnessed it with your children. You can tell your children not to do something all you want, but they are many times going to do it anyway. And one of the most painful things that I hear from parents is when they have to watch their children do something that hurts them. It hurts them. It, parents share in that pain. I believe that God shares in the pain with us because he doesn't want us to go down this path, but he also knows this is the only way that we're going to learn. God didn't want the cross. He didn't want to have Jesus die, but he also knew that that was the only path possible for redemption. God doesn't want you to hurt. He doesn't want me to hurt. But God also knows that sometimes that's the only way that we're ever going to learn, that, that we're ever going to learn that he's enough. Because until that time, we're going to make these attachments on other people and other things, and we're going to seek out worldly advice. And God wants us to know that only he is our God, only he is our deliverer, only he is the true redeemer. So how does God then use those mistakes? Because this is a wonderful thing. Our mistakes are like manure, and the seeds of faith flourish in the manure of life. I'm going to say it again. The seeds of faith flourish in the manure of life. The very things, right, that we pray that God would get rid of, aren't they the very things that cause us to grow? Aren't they the very things that maybe form new relationships in our lives or the things that created the best blessings? At the time, we didn't like it. 
But that's what the Bible says about discipline and hardship. It says, for that time and season, you're not going to like discipline and hardship, but endure it knowing that God is your good and loving Father. Endure it knowing that God's going to create something good out of that. That's why in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Paul says this, It is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That last sentence is the key of why does God allow the hardships? Because here's the thing. God needs to bring us down before he can lift us up. He needs to allow all this stuff to kind of crash on us because you, here's the choice. You can humble yourself or God will do it for you. I remember my mom telling me you can clean your room or I will do it for you. At first I thought this was a great deal. And then I saw the trash bag. And I thought, not so fun now. Yes, the room was clean, but it came at a price. So I can humble myself, but most of the time I won't do that. Remember, going back to what causes my mistakes or my pride. And so, but God needs to get us to this point that we understand that it's only when we recognize that we are nothing that we find out that we are everything in Christ. We are nothing apart from him, but in Christ we have all things. In Christ we are all things. In Christ we find our fulfillment. In Christ we find our hope. And it's not until he begins scaling back all those other things that we get down to that core truth of when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I don't have to sit there looking at that little spiral thing on my computer screen anymore. I can hit that reset button. I can enjoy that new life, but I can't keep doing the same thing that I was doing. That's the definition of insanity. Genesis 50, 20, when it talks about the story of Joseph, Joseph went through lots of perils in order to get himself to this point, in order for God to get him to a point that he could be used. Joseph had a dream. Remember Joseph's dream that he was going to be used and that his brothers would bow down to him and his brothers didn't like that very much. So his, their brothers beat up on him because Joseph was the favorite. Brothers beat up on him, left him for dead, sold him into slavery, did all that stuff, forgot about Joseph. Years later, Joseph ends up going through the school of hard knocks. He's faithful through the school of hard knocks all that time and he ends up the number two in Egypt to the point that his brothers had to come and bow down. And his brothers, when they found out that it was Joseph, they were so ashamed. They needed help. They needed food. But they were so ashamed of what they did. And this is Joseph's response. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. God uses our, the mistakes, our mistakes, and the mistakes of other people Somehow God is the great yard sale king and he loves going out and finding what other people consider as junk and weaving it together and making something wonderful out of it for the benefit of other people. Because understand this, this is a big point. Your life is not your own. When you come to God, when you give yourself to him, you've been bought with a price. And so when you know that you've been bought with a price and when you know that you are already seated with Christ in heavenly places, well, here's the thing. To whom much is given, much is required. And so our lives are then jars of clay filled with this wonderful perfume. But the only way for the perfume to fill the room is for the jar to be opened. God uses hardships in our lives to open the jar to let the perfume of Christ out in this world. You want to know what somebody believes? It's one thing to shout hallelujah on Sunday morning when the choir is singing and when it feels good. It's another thing to shout hallelujah when you're going through a round of chemo treatment. It's another thing to shout hallelujah when you've buried a loved one. It's another thing to shout hallelujah when you've lost your job, when you feel like you got no hope, when you feel like you got no friends. That's where faith comes into play, my friends. It's not what you do on Sunday morning, but what you do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. When the going gets tough, that's when the faith kicks into gear. That's when you know what you got. 
It's not about how much you shout. And what does it tell us about what God delights in? God doesn't delight in our shouting on Sunday morning, but he delights in the sacrifices of a broken and contrite heart that recognizes I am nothing without you, but in you I have everything. Yes, Lord, I've messed this up, and I messed up yesterday, and I'm going to mess up today, and I'm going to mess up tomorrow, but thank God you are bigger than any mess up I ever make. God also uses our mistakes. This is what it says in Romans 8, 28. We are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, works all things, all things work together and are lifting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. God is taking everything and working it together for the good. But it's important to understand when we talk about good that I have a different definition of good than God has a different definition of good, right? My definition and his definition are two different things. He call, We call Friday that Jesus Christ was dot, killed on what? Good Friday. We call it good. Why? I would not call it good. But I call it good because of what happens on Sunday. For the joy set before us. We know that God is working together for the good. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to look good on this side of eternity. It may never look good on this side of eternity. But I believe by faith that one day we will be up there looking down. We'll be looking at the whole realm of eternity and we'll see God's fabric of grace, the quilt of grace that he established through the hardships of our lives because through the hardships of our lives, that's when that perfume goes out. That's when the world is able to see the good that he is doing. He has a much bigger plan. It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about all of us together. It's about the new Jerusalem that he is at work creating. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's important to understand that your mistakes do not define you, but God's redeeming power does. God does not see your mistakes, and it is time that you stop seeing yourself defined by them. To stop it, you have to make that decision. 2 Corinthians 5.17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Everybody say a new person. <laughs> the old life is gone and a new life has begun. Now, some people go, oh, well, that's talking about when I gave myself over to the Lord and when I had that little moment and, you know, I asked Jesus into my heart, which, by the way, I, I haven't found anywhere in the Bible where it says ask Jesus into your right ventricle or your heart there, but rather make him Lord and Savior of your life. But this is not what it's talking about. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new creation, isn't it? Every time that sun rises, it's a new opportunity. Look at what it says in Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. The steadfast of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Look, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Every morning, you get to hit that reset button. Isn't that good news? But some of us are still dragging, like I said, you're dragging yesterday into, into today rather than before you go to bed at night, actually it tells you, do not let the sun go down on your anger. It's okay to get angry, but get over it. Hit the reset button, start all over the next day, right? Because God's at work doing a new thing. He's constantly creating a new creation within us until that point in time when he finishes what he started. When we sh see Jesus, we shall be like him, changed in a twinkling of an eye. We are never out of reach from God's redeeming power. This is what it said in Deuteronomy 30 that we read, but this, listen to the message translation. God, your God, will restore everything you lost. Everybody say everything. everything. He'll have compassion on you. He'll come back and pick up the pieces from all the places where you have scattered. No matter how far away you end up, God, your God, will get you out of there and will bring you back to the land your ancestors once possessed. It will be yours again. He will give you a good life 
and make you more numerous than your ancestors. Can we say amen? amen? So how do we experience this reset? I got five steps for you to take with you. And to do this every day. The first one is, go to God. Jesus says, if you are weary, come unto me and I will give you rest for your soul. You got to go to him. The second one is, you got to humble yourself. Humbling ourselves means that I sit there and I acknowledge I made a boo-boo. I made a mistake. This was the thing. I've done human resources now for a number of years. Now I teach it. But I could never understand that adults aren't that much different than children. And adults, some adults come into work and they do a very bad job. All right. And, and I could never understand it. I'm like, I mean, the things that I had to like deal discipline with, with adults was ridiculous. And I would sit there. But if somebody said to me, I'm sorry, it was so refreshing. If they took responsibility rather than trying to blame adults, blaming on somebody else. If they just admitted and said, I'm sorry, I made a boo-boo. Or in today's language, my bad. But if you just say, I'm sorry, it's so refreshing there because now I can work with you all now. I'm not dealing with the resistance of your ego. How many, I've said this too recently. I would enjoy all the homeless stuff and everything. I could get the job done so much better if I didn't have to deal with the egos of others and the ego looking at me in the mirror. If I wasn't so concerned with my own ego and the egos of other people, I could get the job done. Isn't that true? Couldn't we get a lot more done in our lives if we weren't so concerned with me, myself, and I? And if other people around us weren't so concerned with me, myself, and I? Oh, hum humility sets us free. When I confess my sins and I repent of them, which means confession and repentance, I walk away. I'm set free and I can enjoy this life that God's given me to enjoy. The third one is, don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. This is what it says in Proverbs. And if you think that I, if I have some parse words with my manure language, because some of you get tired of me talking about poop and manure, this is what it says in Proverbs. Like a dog returns to vomit, so a fool returns to their folly. I've watched a dog return to their vomit. And it's disgusting. Saves me from having to clean it up, but it's disgusting nonetheless. My friends, how many of us keep going back to the same people? Keep going back to the same thing. We expect something different. Durr, ain't gonna happen. Don't go back doing the same thing. Ask God, God's doing a new thing. God, where are you leading me? And then take a step. Get a pair of kahunes and take that step. I'm so tired of people talking about plans and taking a step. Just do something. Get out of your own way and go. What's the worst that's going to happen? You ain't birthing babies. Well, some of you might be. <laughs> but here's the thing. Number four, when you make a mistake, don't condemn yourself. Stop talking about how bad you are. Start talking about what God says you are, who God says you are. Start focusing on the good stuff. Set your mind on heavenly things and keep it set, the Bible says. And lastly, trust and rely upon God's wisdom. If you make a wrong step, God will get you back on the right path. Remember what it said in Deuteronomy 30. If you've been far off, no matter how far you've gotten, I'll come back and get you. I'll pick up the broken pieces. It's going to be okay. I'm coming for you. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. In other words, get moving. And don't be afraid if you make a mistake because God puts up detour signs all the time. And he'll put you on the right path. As long as you are seeking after him, his approval, and his new thing and good thing with all your heart. My friends, it is never, ever too late to hit that reset button. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how far away you've strayed, we all get to come back home because the great hound of heaven hasn't given up on you. Don't give up on him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for the hope and the joy and the peace that we have in you. I pray for each person that has heard this message or will hear this message that they will come to know the freedom that is found in Christ. That they will be set free from their past. That they will start being able to sing a new song again. And may your joy be our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay, really.